So my next speaker is uh, Keith Holliday from Sunoco Products. And Keith has been working on how do we change the mental model of the supply chain to be more sustainable. He's going to talk about how his company isn't the sexiest company, but uh, I think you do some pretty sexy things, Keith. So here you go. Well, thanks, Laura. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're not, we're not very sexy. Oh, I don't okay. know. <laughs> but we do appreciate it. Um, how many of you are familiar with Sunoco products? How many of those think they buy gasoline from us? <laughs> That's the other guys, okay? Sunoco, we're Sunoco. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the company to kind of set the table for what we're gonna talk about this morning. Um, but first, you know, I'm, I really was excited by the forward focus of this morning's topics. You know, you think about additive manufacturing, crowd economy, you know, robotics. I mean, these are exciting areas that are going to change our world, but um, I'm not going to continue that string. I'm going to bring you back to reality and talk about companies the way we are today, because we're much more traditional manufacturing than, you know, you've been hearing about this morning. We are a packaging company. Um, we've been around since 1899, so we're 115 years old. We uh, were about a $5 billion company. We sold $4.8 billion last year. We just made a recent acquisition that's gonna put us at about 5.3 this year. So that, we hope, brings us into the Fortune 500. You know, we've always, we've always wanted to be there. <laughs> we couldn't organically grow ourselves there, so we had to buy our way there, but we think, we think that'll put us into the Fortune 500. Pretty exciting, pretty exciting place for us. Um, this chart shows the products that we make, and you've used our products. You may not have known that we produce them, but we think about our company in four buckets. Um, it's a big bucket of, let's see, does this thing work? Yeah, consumer packaging, and we still use the word consumer, okay, because we have CPG companies that we serve and supply, some of them here today. Um, we, so we have a large consumer business. Um, a product example you'd be familiar with would be Pringles cans. We make Pringles cans. We make craft re reclosable cookie containers. Okay, that's our technology. Um, in fact, when you think about Pringles, we make three million cans a day in Jackson, Tennessee at that one location. That's 50 trucks a day of cans, okay, shuttling back and forth. And so because of that, our supply chains tend to need to be close coupled to our customers. And so we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that when I, when I talk about how our supply chains are configured and how they work. The second bucket is display and packaging, and we provide packaging services for many of our customers. So if you buy Gillette razors, we package them, okay? You know, if you buy Lego, we packaged it, okay? We, we do it in all regions of the world. So we provide packaging services for those companies that don't want to do that work for themselves because that's our core competency. That, so those two groups really form the, the core of our, our consumer side, if you will. We also make industrial packages. So we make paper and industrial converted products. So anything that's wound was probably wound on one of our cores. So paper, fiber, film, Producers all buy our cores to wind their products on, and we make the paper that goes into those cores. So, you know, you heard um, Cisco talk about moving 60,000 tons of material. We move 1.4 million tons of paper a year, okay, not counting all the things that, are, that it's converted into. Uh, so that's kind of the industrial product side. And then uh, we have a new business that we acquired about two years ago. Um, we call it Protective Solutions. This is temperature assured packaging and other types of packaging that protect large products like white goods. So we make the, you know, the structural posts that let you stack six dryers in a warehouse on top of each other without collapsing, but yet not add much weight to shipping. Um, but we also, our big season right now is, is going on. Uh, flu vaccine is shipped in temperature assured containers and we produce those. And in fact, we're a little upset because we filled up the warehouse getting ready for the season and the season is just now getting started. They're shipping very, very late this year. I'm not sure what that means. We'll find out, I guess. Uh, so that's, that's the way our business is grouped. We have about 20,000 employees. We, uh, we have plants in 
35 countries, okay, so we're a global company. And I was telling somebody earlier, we have 340 plants. Okay, now why would a $5 billion company have 340 plants? Well, because we've got to make our core materials in fairly large manufacturing facilities, but then when we convert it, we're going to convert as close to our customers as we can. So it's late-stage customization at its best. It's inherently lean. Okay? So that's about us. Um, what, is, what is true about packaging? It's all waste. Everything we produce is waste, okay? It has a role to play in the supply chain of protecting the product, but once the product is in the hands of the consumer, the ultimate consumer, and gets consumed, then the package is no longer needed. It's done its job. And so when you think about saving the planet, how can a packaging company talk about saving the planet when everything we produce is waste? Okay, so I'm going to try, to try to answer that question for you. So we have got a fairly good reputation out there as a sustainable packaging company. We're one of two packaging companies that are on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Uh, we, uh, we, we fit into the Newsweek green rankings. We're uh, among the most admired companies, and we're among the best corporate citizens. So there's some things we're doing right in managing this business which ultimately produce waste. So let me go to the Dow Jones kind of definition, okay? Now when you see sustainability, you immediately think environment, right? And I'm gonna talk about the environment, but sustainable supply chains are not just about the environment. When you look at the sustainability index criteria, and by the way, if you ever apply for it, it's about 100 pages for the application, so it's, uh, they're really getting into a lot of depth of how your business works. I pulled out some of the supply chain dimensions that they look at when they think about sustainable supply chains. There are economic dimensions because if all you do is take care of the environment and you don't have a viable business, then you're gonna go out of business and the good that you do is gonna go away. Okay, so a sustainable supply chain is also one that manages its economic aspects very well. That's risk management, that's customer relationship management, uh, that's overall supply chain management. It's an important element of having a sustainable supply chain. If you look at the, the environmental part, which of course you were expecting to hear about, uh, certainly environmental policy, how your corporation positions itself, the importance that it gives to uh, running sustainable operations, that's critical. Operational eco-efficiency, how much energy you consume, what's your carbon footprint, uh, what happens to your products. So product stewardship is critical. And this one's a big one for a packaging company because uh, what ultimately happens to our material is going to determine whether we're doing this well or not. Okay. If all that happens is it all ends up in a landfill, we really haven't done our jobs, have we, for, the, for society as a whole. And then finally, there's some social dimensions as well, human capital development, getting the right talent in place. You know, all the things that we've been talking about here in this conference about having the right people in order to be able to execute well, this is also critical in having a sustainable supply chain. So economic, Environmental, social are all important in this sustainability area. So if you look at what we do, um, we start with uh, packaging design, innovation, artwork management. If you want us to, to design your brand for you, we can do that. If you think about what packaging does, I already described one dimension, which was protect the product and get it to the hands of the consumer. But a second one is managing the brand because typically the first thing the customer sees when they look at a consumer package on the shelf is they see that package, okay? They don't see the product that's inside of it, although we're making packages now. We have clear cans, okay, where you can see the, the food that's in it. And that's gaining some, some interest out there as a, as a new innovation because people would like to see what's in it. But normally what you see is you see the package, okay? So we can help with that. Uh, we offer a complete range of, uh, of consumer packaging and industrial packaging, as I've already mentioned. We do 
paper-based, we do film-based flexible packaging, we do plastics, thermoforming, injection molding, blow molding, you know, all of the various packaging formats we can provide. We also provide help in retail merchandising and in brand management. And as I mentioned, we have supply chain packaging services as well. So we can take you all the way from your package inception, what your concept is. That's how we ended up with the reclosable cookie container. You know, we want a package that can be reclosed so that, you know, the product stays fresher and, you know, you don't try rubber bands around it, which all of us did before the reclosable package came out. You know, so they came in with a concept, which we then put some ideas together and came up with the package together with them and, you know, then looked at how, okay, what kind of branding do you want to do? How do you want to manage this? How do you handle uh, tamper resistance? Okay, so you have to have tamper indicators on it, you know, and those types of things. So how to do all that. And then finally, you know, as it's getting, it's, it's done its job, it's now no longer a value-added part of the supply chain, it's now going to be waste, what do you do with it? We do have a recycling operation. It's one of our divisions. And through our recycling operations, we recover the equivalent of 65% of everything we put into the environment. Okay, so that's how one of the ways that we reduce our societal footprint. We've had a recycling division since the 1920s. Uh, we did this not because of we wanted to be helpful to the environment, although we certainly wanted to do that, but we need fiber. We make paper. Um, we make 1.4 million tons of paper. It's 100% recycle. And so we need to acquire fiber. And so we set up a recycling division to acquire fiber. We, have, we do about 3 million tons of recycled materials a year. That's a lot of truckloads of material. Think about how many that is. Um, we have about 40 processing facilities, plus or minus, around the world. And we even have some ultra-modern, full-scale, single-stream, what we call MRFs, material recovery facilities, where we can sort all the materials that come in so it comes into us as mixed waste. We can separate out the plastics, the metals, the fiber, you know, into the, the parts that we want and, uh, you know, sell off what we don't want. Uh, and we also move the, the stuff around the world. Okay, so we'll, we'll ship fiber to China, you know. They had all those empty boats, you know, going over to China because they were bringing all the goods over here and somebody got smart over there and built a bunch of paper mills and filled those empty ships up with recycled fiber. <laughs> you know, so we've got to deal with the Chinese even in the recycled fiber area, which you wouldn't think. Uh, so about 65% of the material we receive at our facilities, and it doesn't do me any good to point at this, does it? Um, <laughs> but it's intuitive. It might, you know, it's sort of sitting there. It makes you want to do it. Um, but 65% of what we collect goes directly to Sunoco plants, okay, for use in making new packaging. And even when you look at tubes and cores, most of the time we pick those tubes and cores back up and we bring it back into our paper mills, okay, and we put them back into the, back into the system. So it's a vertically integrated supply chain when you look at the paper-based supply chain. Okay, so we collect it. We have, we have municipal contracts. We'll pick up the waste at the curb in a number of cities. We'll take it to our sorting facilities. Uh, we'll get the fiber, we'll send the fiber to our paper mills, we'll turn it back into good paper, we'll convert that paper into tubes and cores, into composite cans, into other products, and then it repeats the cycle. It goes through, takes the product to the customer, we pick it up again, bring it back, and, uh, and, and it's a very sustainable cycle. We also offer our recycle technology, if you will, to other companies. So we have a product we call S3, which is Sunoco Sustainability Solutions. And we have contracts with many large producers, in primarily in the US, but some in Europe as well, uh, where we help them go landfill free, OK? And we have an award process as well, where we recognize those customers that have done very well and become essentially landfill free. So we know solid waste very well because we've been in this business a long time. And so we not only do it for ourselves, we do it for our customers. 
So sustainable supply chains, what are they? Well, we've talked some about the economic dimensions. Now we'll talk about how do you, how do you have a supply chain that's going to keep going over time. So you really want optimized and agile supply chains because that minimizes your environmental footprint. If your supply chain is very well optimized in terms of where it's located, the transportation that's required, um, you also will have a low carbon footprint. Those, that 1.4 million tons of paper we produce and the tubes and cores that come out of it are 300,000 truck shipments a year, okay? 800 a day, okay? So there's a lot of trucks we're moving around. We're burning a lot of fuel. And so we run optimization models to say, how can we minimize the routes that we're on? How can we minimize the amount of fuel that's required in order to, uh, in order to move the materials around that we do? Now, we don't do that necessarily to just improve the carbon footprint because it also saves a lot of money. Uh, if you look at the cost of recycle in the business, 30% of it is transportation, okay? And so it's a huge impact on whether we can make money at that or not. I mean, you've seen what's going on in the recycle world, right? There's a lot of municipalities that have quit collecting and recycling materials because the price gets low, and so they quit picking it up or they don't know what to do with it when they get it, you know? And you always wonder, okay, they picked it up, did anything actually happen with it, or did they take it to the landfill? You know, well, in some cases, they're taking it to the landfill because you have to be very, very efficient at doing this. So we have to have supply chains that are very, very efficient, very, very effective, and fully optimized. Now, we've got many types of supply chains. I mentioned the, that we have 340 plants. Well, some of those are very much push optimization type supply chain. So paper manufacturing is expensive. The machines are multi-million dollars. You know, you really want to manufacture paper in central locations, okay, where you can optimize and leverage your capabilities. And so that's a, an example of a push supply chain. And what's important in a push supply chain? Forecasting, SNOP, supply chain disciplines. And so we run a very effective SNOP process I was, I was telling Laura, she's, she, uh, she helped us in getting some of this set up when we were early in the game. And uh, we've gotten our demand error rate down to, you know, at a high level in the 3 to 5% three to range is typically what we see. And even when you take it down to the family level, you know, we're in the 10% error rate range. Well, that gives us the information we need to optimize that paper network. Because you run your paper mills 100% loaded, Okay, it's the only way, well, only way to make paper money in the paper business. You have to run them fully loaded. And so we have to continually rebalance them, okay? So that's the push part of the, of the world. And then most of our plants are more in the pull, agile type of supply chain, okay? So when you make a tube or a core, you keep your raw material, you keep your inventory in raw materials because your manufacturing lead time is very short. And you typically have a one to three day lead time and you don't know what your customers are gonna order precisely, so you keep it in raw materials and you make the order. And so that's what we mean by a pull supply chain. They, the need is to be very, very agile, very, very responsive to customer needs and be able to jump in and make what's needed when, when they need it, okay? And when I first got to Sunoco, one of the big conflicts was the paper guys were saying, hey, what's, what is it with these tube and core cowboys, you know? They never know what they're gonna make. They never know what they're gonna order, you know? And we're trying to run a dis disciplined supply chain. How, do we, how can we possibly do that? And the tube and core guys, they're going, these paper guys are so rigid. You know, it's all about discipline and data and forecasting and, you know, that doesn't fit our business model. And so they had this conflict. And, you know, what we finally succeeded in doing was getting them convinced that, yes, there are two different models, and no, they're not supposed to be alike. And the secret sauce is how do you manage that push-pull interface so that the supply chain works seamlessly across the whole and we have a fully optimized supply chain end-to-end. -end. And then we have some that I call composite supply chains. They have elements of push and elements of pull. And the reason is they're not part of our vertically integrated supply chain, so they have to buy raw materials. Uh, we make metal ends for cans. We make 10 billion of them a year, okay, or something like that. I don't think anybody's actually counted them. 
but we make a lot of them. And uh, the lead time on tin-plated steel is 16 weeks. Okay, so they're ordering today what they're going to use in December. Okay, basically. And that's tough, okay, that's, a, that's push. You've got to be able to forecast that need. Yet at the same time, you know, they're feeding metal ends into agile supply chains, okay? Composite cans has a seven-day lead time, so they can't live with 16 weeks of lead time. You know, they've got to have it in inventory ready for them to go. And so there's elements of both here. They have inventory in raw materials, and they have inventory in uh, finished goods. But so how do you make that work? Well, you've got to have integrated information flows and you've got to have collaborative planning. You've got to have some idea of what the customer is really going to need. So I think the first step in really having an optimized, agile, sustainable supply chain is to, un to be able to segment it, understand what the needs are of that supply chain, understand what uh, disciplines you need to have in place and what elements of agility you need to have in place and get the right balance. So this just kind of shows what I've just described in words and a little bit of a picture. If you look at the industrial vertically integrated supply chain, you've got both elements of push, paper manufacturing, and pull converting, okay? If you look at the consumer supply chains, they're a lot more complicated because we don't own the whole supply chain. We're buying this one, this example here, we're buying film from typically large integrated Producers, okay, Exxon Mobil, you know, Dow Chemical selling us plastics and film, you know, and these guys are so responsive, you know, to smaller companies like Sunoco. You know, they, they love to have us around, but they don't want to change anything for us because we're not big enough to, to be able to do that. And so we have to work with very large um, suppliers in many cases, and most of our customers are many times our size. So. You know, this, this is a, a picture of a craft uh, bakery in Chicago. So film coming in, we print it, we uh, die cut it to make the uh, Oreo reclosable container, ship it to the, to the bakery, and they produce the ultimate package. And so, you know, we've got we've to blend all these things together, which means we have to do collaborative planning. And indeed, we do collaborative planning with craft to try to make sure that we're meeting their needs at most effective cost and most, uh, most effective inventory, but, but to have a responsive enough supply chain that they really get what they're looking for. And of course, it's Mondelez now, but. <laughs> Change comes hard, you know, I still call them craft. <laughs> the other part though, when you look at some of the criteria that the Dow Jones Sustainability Index had was risk management. That was one of the biggest sustainable areas you have to be able to prove that you're managing well because um, if you're going to be able to run an efficient supply chain that has the best environmental footprint, you've got to be able to, to manage the risks in the supply chain. And so one of the things they look for is close integration with customers and suppliers. You know, do you do collaborative planning? Uh, do you fully understand your customer needs? Do you talk to each other? You know, how do you share information? Um, you know, how do you, how do you do efficient transportation in the integrated supply chain across the whole? And that's why we have so many operations is we'll locate as close to our customers as we possibly can. Okay, either a grouping geographically or like GMIs here, we, we have a plant, we have our plants close coupled to theirs where we go through the wall. Okay, and there's a polyethylene strip that separates the plants and you can kind of walk through and say hi to each other. You know, and that's how close coupled we are. Um, but also this idea of, okay, we're going to encourage our suppliers to also be uh, sustainable in what they do. So we offer this Supplier Sustainability Award Program where we recognize our suppliers that are truly being both efficient, responsive, and at the same time working on their environmental footprint. And we do supplier relationship management, but I think you recognize, you know, as supply chain professionals and as those that support supply chains, you can't do that level of integration with everybody. You know, there's just right now it's a very manual kind of thing. And, and we struggle even, you know, we hear all these wonderful things about what we're going to do with big data and, and all that kind of stuff. We can't even transmit orders across the, the company boundaries effectively in many cases. 
So right now, Unilever is telling us, okay, we want to do EDI. We want to EDI all our orders to you. Okay, well, two years ago, they were auto-faxing everything out of SAP. It would go to a physical fax machine. We'd get 75 to 100 faxes a week, okay, most of which had no changes. And so you're leafing through 100 pages of paper to try to find the one or two changes that were made, okay? And you miss things. You know, it's inefficient. And so then we got better. We started exchanging, okay, give me your MRP run out of SAP so we can see what it is that you're planning to make. Okay, so we started doing that. And now we're trying to take the next step of let's, let's integrate our systems. Okay, can we send you EDI? Okay, well, what's interesting was one of the struggles is that we get three change orders for every order that comes through in, in one particular business. Okay, and so there's actually... 10 new orders and 30 change orders every day, every day. So when you get it through EDI, how do you deal with it, okay? Does some person intercept it, or do you, do you put some things in place to help you do that? And so those, those are things we're working on to try to build um, some greater efficiencies in our end-to-end -end supply chain, but also take out the errors, take out the mistakes, which cause you to make product which is not what they want, and you end up either putting it in inventory and hope they take it someday or, or writing it off, okay, which is also an environmental impact. It's also an economic impact. So it impacts all dimensions of how we run sustainable supply chains. And the other thing we're doing is we're doing an assessment of supply risk. So a annually I go out to all of the, you know, all the purchasing people and, and get them to assess and develop scenarios on – what would happen if we had a supply interruption? Is there a second source? Is there a, you know, is there another supplier we can go to? You know, what's our backup plans? What's our contingency plans? And we do contingency planning and scenario modeling to, to make sure we're ready to handle those types of risks. We had one recently that, you know, we think was actually impacted by the, you know, by the uh, uh, disaster that happened in Japan because there were many dyes made in Japan, and because they couldn't get the dyes, they started substituting fillers, okay, in the inks that we were using, and those fillers started eroding our printing cylinders, and all of a sudden we go from uh, 3 million feet of printing to 100,000, okay? Subtle change happens as a result of a faraway event that we never imagined a connection like that, okay? So how do you envision those? How do you, how do you put plans in place to deal with them? And then I think this is kind of my final topic is, is really supply chain talent. Okay, how do we keep the right people so that we can do this job very, very efficiently? So we have a corporate team that's been developing what has historically been division-defined roles. Every supply chain manager's job was different. Some had supply chain analysts, some had you know, schedulers at the plant. Some plants would take a light-duty mechanic, and all of a sudden he's a machine scheduler, okay? I mean, the reality of what, what you deal with at a plant, right? So we've been trying to define those roles, okay, so that we have standard roles, standard training, standard capabilities required. We've also been using uh, Apex to help us train our folks, help people understand what's the end-to-end -end supply chain, how do I work within it? We're starting to do some selective use of developmental assignments, too, giving people a, a, a more broad perspective of how the different jobs in supply chain are done. And uh, just recently, I started hiring, this goes back to that analytical thing, right? I'm hiring some young analytical system savvy talent to come in and help us begin to take all of this data we've got and get some knowledge out of it, okay? Be able to do the type of analytics we've been talking about here. How do we do scenario modeling? How do we do demand planning better, and we're starting to see some benefit from that. And then the, the, the last point I think I wanted to make here was we actually do involve our supply chain in new product development. The pictorial you see in front of you is our innovation cycle we call I-6, and you can see some of the I's there, iteration, insights, integration, you know, all those things. But you'll notice that one of the elements here is supply chain integration. So we try to recognize the unique, I'm pointing at this thing again. So you see supply chain integration. And some, one of the things we're trying to do is, 
is capitalize on those unique characteristics of our segmented supply chains. If you need a pull responsive supply chain for this new product, we know how to do that. If you need a highly disciplined structured supply chain, we know how to do that. But get us in the game early so that we can help in the innovation cycle to accelerate time to market. But also, as we start up these new products, we have standardized processes and metrics to drive these new product lines. We have the right level of discipline right from the beginning. What we've often found is you bring a new product to the marketplace, and an example of that was the reclosable cookie container. In the beginning, it was they gave us all the small volume products, and then all of a sudden, they wanted to go to Oreos. Okay. So how do you scale up from what was essentially a semi-works kind of operation? We went from 6 million packages a month to uh, we added 34 million. That's how many Oreo containers okay, that, that you have in the process. And so really, that's the story that I wanted to bring to you, um, that a packaging company can be environmentally friendly, you know, deal with our environmental footprint and producing something that essentially becomes waste in almost every case, and doing that with a, a, a good environmental societal footprint, but also the idea that sustainable supply chains are also efficient, they're disciplined, and they're optimized because you cannot do the low environmental footprint with an inefficient supply chain that's constantly in, in churn. So with that, I'll leave you with this uh, mood slide. Go buy Sunoco stock. We pay dividends. <laughs> We've done it for a long time. <laughs> so, Laura, back to you. Yeah, well, thank you, Keith. I love your story. And you know, I was thinking about the prior panel where they were talking about taking the friction out of the touch points with the customer and building the foundation and getting people on board with talents. And this wasn't easy. I think I've been working with you for about eight years. Do you That's have any right. insights uh, building off of that panel and the mental models? Well, you know, the panel did a really nice job of really defining a potential future state. Okay, now all of, some of us that are running 100-year-old equipment, we have a hard time envisioning the journey between here and there. But at the same time, you know, that could be the end state. And I think what you're describing is how do we get from where we are to there? Yes. And, and you've seen it as we've gone through it. We've layered in capabilities. You yes. Know, when I got to, to Sunoco um, to start a supply chain program, which is why they brought me in, one of, the, one of the groups got with me and said, okay, we've, we've been told we need an SNOP process, okay? And we're not sure what it is, but we've been reading the book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I said, which book have you been reading? <laughs> which one of the many <laughs> books have you been reading, right? Yeah, so they told me which book they were reading, so that gave me a starting point right. of how do I connect with these guys, okay? And so we started by, okay, let's begin to talk. We, we have a vertically integrated supply chain here. Let's talk to your internal customers because there's no boundary, right? We can share information. So let's start with that. What do we know about their need for your product, okay? Then you start to deal with, okay, I need some, maybe I need some new technology, mm -hmm. okay, to help me, help me do that. But you have to start with what you know, right? okay? And then once you outgrow what you know and you need a better source of knowledge, then you start to layer in additional capabilities and you keep layering it in. And, you know, talent's one of those that we've taken for granted, but now we're saying, no, we can't do that anymore. Right. You know, now we have to layer that capability in to really manage talent. Yes, absolutely. Anybody got a question for Keith before we transition to our sustainability panel? Uh, you know, because Keith, I love what you've done on SNOP. I love what you've done on talent. Uh, I appreciate you coming today. Um, you know, as you think about that foundation and you think about, you know, how you really embrace mental models, is there anything you'd like to leave the audience with? Yeah, and I think we've said it several times, one size does not fit all. You know, these businesses really are different. Mm -hmm. you know, they say they're different and they do it in a way that separates themselves mm -hmm. rather than integrates. Yes. And I think the trick has been is acknowledge the difference. Okay, yeah, I accept there's differences but there's more power in integration than there is in separation. So yes. let's figure out where those touch points are and begin to build that end-to-end -end kind of approach. I like that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a good one.